everybody. We're so good to uh, be back here. Did everybody enjoy the food? Good. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, this is uh, this is my first time at the venison dinner. I forgot to introduce myself earlier. I'm the new pastor here at Grace Chapel. And, uh, my name is Josiah. So. If, Nice to officially, unofficially meet some of you all. But this is my first time at the Venison Dinner. And I'll tell you what, I thought the meal was phenomenal. I just want to take a moment and uh, thank everybody from the church who has contributed their time and everybody that cooked as well, uh, because it takes a lot of hands to make that much food for that many people without just having it catered. So I want to thank the people of Grace Chapel. Uh, and again, for the whole church, we're going to put this on. It's just been a wonderful thing. Well, again, we're excited to have Steve here. It's been wonderful to hear him so far, kind of hear the beginning of his story, and I'm really excited to hear about uh, how it turns and how God gets involved in his life and how he ended up using him uh, in the big game industry and all these other things and how he has the privilege now to go and share his story. So we want to welcome Steve back up, if he would come back up, and then we're going to again have the raffle afterwards if you all be willing to stay for that. Thank you all again for coming. It was good to have you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a tremendous dinner. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. This is like church, right? Everyone stays in the back. But I'm going to tell you, the prizes go to everyone in the front here. So if you want to move up, there's plenty of room up here. Don't worry. I will call on you. Most of the time I call on people, it's in the back. So that's how I, that's how I roll. Um, so... You know, I gave you a little bit of an intro about me and my story. We talked about this idea of success to significance. We talked about focusing on myself instead of thinking about others. And that purpose, I said I wanted to have you think about your purpose. And my purpose, as I said, was to know him and to make him known. And this a lot of what I do is based on that, but it all happens here. And I think it's by no accident that this is the sign as you enter Potter County. And it's not far from here, actually. It says, welcome to Potter County, God's country. And I think, as I reflect on this, I truly believe that we don't really know what we have. Do you know that we have over two and a half million acres in just Pennsylvania to, to enjoy, to recreate, to hike, to hunt, to fish? Two and a half million acres. And I guess my heart, I, I don't even know, sometimes I realize what we have. I spent some time in China. I mentioned that earlier. And when you see what goes on in places where I've watched families, families live out of cardboard box and if you think COVID was bad here in China I have friends that for eight weeks couldn't leave their apartment and the government controls everything they're on their phones so this is my pitch for you guys to know how blessed we are of what we have in Pennsylvania I mean where can you go to see some of the best big game hunting in the world and I mean that Pennsylvania has some of the largest bears anywhere. And this is one of my favorites. My passion is elk hunting. And this was in Potter County, behind my camp. So they've come into Potter County from Benezet. This is a picture that I took in August. And then turkey hunting. Turkey hunting and elk hunting actually have something in common. They actually communicate. It's amazing. If you haven't tried it, you should, because you'll get hooked. All right. I mentioned before dinner that I have two prizes here. So, yes, this is the chance. I'm going to ask you. This is a Yeti brand-new mug. So my question is... For all you deer hunters in this room, and I'm going to try to do this fair, whoever puts the hand up and gets the right answer first wins. What happened in 2002 that changed the dynamics in whitetail hunting in Pennsylvania? I, I'm going to go right here. Antler restrictions. Yes, antler restrictions. Thank you. You, you got it. In fact, this was the 20th year. 
This was the 20 year anniversary. And I don't know about you, but here's a picture from Potter County, and this is, this is all public land. And to see what's actually happened since antler restrictions, and I'm not here to debate plus or minus, I'm just telling you that it's beautiful to see some of these animals. I mentioned earlier that I'm just finishing up my book on traditional Pennsylvania deer camp. And once I realized my purpose, I just continue to invite family and friends and non-hunters to my cabin in Potter County. This is it, called the Shoebox 2. And the reason I'm write, writing the book and finishing it is I had a friend that I invited, and I just ask you all to think about being a mentor. If it's not your own kids, a neighbor, invite them to experience what God has given us. Because it could change their life, and I'm worried about that with technology. But I had a friend that I invited up for deer camp, and he called me when he got home, and he said, Steve, this was life-changing. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, the stories and the traditions, I never, ever experienced that. It's unbelievable. So earlier, I talked about my dad. My dad's on this side. Not only was a Christian clown, but he was someone that had all sorts of contests. So with the other camps in the area, we had a big buck contest. It's hard to see this, but the winning camp got to put and display the Daniel Boone Award in your camp. And unfortunately, we lost that year, so we had to put the Dead Carp Award visual as you walked into our camp. Unfortunately, we laughed. This is my dad, and cried. Played music, told stories. An incredible experience. And I hope some of you in here have had a chance to experience Pennsylvania Deer Camp. My hope is someday they'll, they'll go back to Monday to give us more time to celebrate. But I really want to talk about this guy here. I want to talk about elk. And I want to talk about how magnificent. Did you know that Pennsylvania had over 100,000 elk. For 400 years, 100,000 elk. It was actually called the Eastern Woodland Elk. Unfortunately, without seasons or regulations, they went extinct in 1860. They went extinct. And that led to the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Pennsylvania Game Commission was established in 1895. At that point, the Pennsylvania Game Commission said, we need to figure out a way to bring the elk back to Pennsylvania. So in 1913, 1913, via rail cars, 72 elk were purchased. Actually, 50 and 22. Anyone have an idea what an elk cost from Yellowstone? They were all from Yellowstone. Any idea? This is not a prize. I have another. What is it? In 1913. In 1913. $750. 12 bucks. 12. Close. You win. It was $30. $30. $30. So then in 1915, they bought 95 more. And the elk that are here today are from Yellowstone, the Rocky Mountain elk. And right now, depending on who you talk to, there are 1,400 to 1,600 elk in Pennsylvania. How many of you in here have been to Benazette, the Elk Visitor Center? I love it. I love it. All of you should go. And I would highly recommend it. And if you want to really get a thrill, go at the end of August, September, and October because it's just majestic. But I'm also going to challenge you, because I've been asking some people here tonight, and I'm disappointed, how many in here have actually applied for an elk license? That is not the same as the hands that I saw earlier. 
I'm telling you, you guys have to do this. Now, it does hurt me. I've been putting in for 21 years, but you need to do this. It's $11. There's three seasons. It's $11. And you might say, oh, I don't, there's no chance. I have four good friends. And that's not counting a few that I just made. I have four good friends that drew an elk in Pennsylvania. Amazing. You guys need to do it. And gals, it's unbelievable. In fact, three years ago, and I won't forget this because the, the feed, someone turn their phone off, the feed, when they announced who wins the drawing was done live on Facebook, and I was trying to listen to it that day, and my good friend Dave was listening to it when they called his name. He's one of my four friends, so he called me up and said, Steve, you need to go with me. So I filmed this hunt. It's hard to see in this picture, unfortunately. This is an 8x8 that's in the record book. It took us, the first day we walked 14 miles, and I actually talked to somebody about this because they said, oh, hunting elk is easy in Pennsylvania because they're looking at the visitor center. You don't, help, you don't hunt elk in the visitor center. <laughs> Might be nice, but you don't help. And I will say, in fact, not only did I have this experience, but this past year I started guiding. And I guided uh, two hunts. I guided uh, my first hunt in October, and we were successful. And I guided my second hunt late season. And I have two individuals that were with me. They're here tonight. Unfortunately, the Scott here, who was the successful hunter, uh, could not be here tonight. But Denny and Jason, raise your hand back there. There are other guys that sit in the back seat in the Bob Euchre seats. But, but they were with me. And again, that person that came up to me and said, it's, elk hunting is easy in Pennsylvania, I'm telling you. And I had them all scouted, and they were there. Do you remember what happened after Christmas, how cold it got, and then there was ice and snow? Those elk left. And if you want to have a good story, we'll talk to... Danny and Jason back there because I'll never forget. You guys remember this? So I'm worried now because I have this amazing responsibility to provide to get a cow elk. And by the way, the percentage of success for cows in Pennsylvania was 61% this year. For bulls, it was 98%. So we had a hard time. But I'll never forget. It was like I think our second or third day, we at least started to see sign. Right? We felt good. We were setting up on a pipeline that had planted. And I'll never forget it. Because as it started to get light, we looked 400 yards away and there was an elk. So Scott, we, we got excited. We got him ready. Everyone has the binoculars. We're talking to each other. One person would say, oh, I think it's a cow. No, I think it's a bull. And then unfortunately, it was an 8 by 8 <laughs> And that's all we saw. I mean, opening morning, we were ready. We thought this was going to be easy, right? Bulls. Everything we saw were bulls, right? Unbelievable. But I can't emphasize enough what a thrill it is to be able to have a chance to experience these amazing animals. And again, it will hurt my chances, but the beauty is that even if you don't get drawn, you know what? That $11 goes into habitat, and I've seen what habitat has done. These food plots matter. Because see, elk are grazers, and the real challenge they had after 1915 was the farmers were shooting them because the elk didn't have the habitat they needed. Now they do. I also, at the very beginning, told you I wanted to pass on some tips. And most of my tips I'm passing on are life tips, but this one's a hunting tip. And this is through my own mistakes. It's pretty simple. I call it the four Ps. But I'm going to tell you right now is when you should be planning. And the preparation starts now for next year. Most of the whitetails have returned to their habitat. So you can not only look for sheds, but you can figure out what are those game trails that I need to rethink about? Maybe I need to move my tree stand right now. There's too many individuals that I talk to at these events or at shows that say, ah, you don't need to do that. I just go out, you know. 
opening week. I'm just telling you the most important part is these pieces. And perseverance might be my favorite one. I love to elk hunt. And you're going to see a picture of an elk that I shot. But after, that was after walking 92 miles and not giving up. When we walked 14 miles that first day of that elk trip, it was difficult because we didn't see anything. We didn't even see a sign. But you can't give up. So what I'm going to do with you next is I'm going to show you footage. One of the things that I had an opportunity to do is to produce and create a television show, a hunting show called Gore-Tex Outdoor Adventures. And I'll never forget it. Bill Jordan, who is the owner of Realtree, is a friend of mine, and he said, Steve, there's 270, which is true, there's 275 TV shows. Why do you need another TV show? Hunting show, sorry. I said, the reason is I want to assemble the best hunters in the world, and I want every hunting episode to be authentic. None of this high fence stuff that you do, you don't really realize what's happening. I've filmed it. I know what I'm talking about. But I think the other thing is provide real tips, usable tips. And one of the things I love most about hunting, honestly, is the opportunity to reflect and this might be old school, but I'm telling you, it's another one of these free tips I'm giving you. This is a little notebook, and I'm tired, and I get caught up into my phone as well. But I would have you buy a little notebook, especially I talked to one of these younger individuals here. This has been so valuable to me. Because you know what I do? When I go in the field, I capture the wind direction, I capture the temperature, where I am, and I can go back and reflect on the moon phase and really understand what happened in that same area and look at what I need to do and what stand I need to hunt. It's all in this book. The other thing it does is it gives me a great chance to reflect. So a little tip there. So I'm going to show you this and then we're going to talk about the mistakes that I made. Um, so here goes. Vortex Outdoor Adventures. The most impressive group of hunters ever assembled. All coming together to share their knowledge and passion for the outdoor. Meeting challenges, sharing techniques, crossing the globe. It's the greatest hunting found on Earth. This is Vortex Outdoor Adventures. Welcome to Gore-Tex Outdoor Adventures. And I'm Stan Potts, and this week we're headed to Dillon, Montana, Bob, with Steve Schuster of Gore-Tex. He's got a white tail, an antelope, and an elk tag. Archery. Archery. Yeah, I wonder which one he's going to use first. Well, I don't know, but let's go take a look, and we'll find out. In the wide open spaces, pond horn seek. Cover can be hard to come by. To combat that, and try and get his hunter close enough for a bow shot on these notoriously high strung animals, Alex will first put Steve in a ground line. Well, I started hunting really with my, my grandfather, who passed it on to my father. Uh, we still go up to a uh, cabin in western Pennsylvania uh, every fall together with about 10 friends. Uh, and that's what it's all about. Uh, hunting for me has always been a part of life um, in, in relationships. Uh, it's not about the end game, it's about uh, developing friendships uh, that last forever. Some of my best friends, that's all I've met them. Uh, so it, it really started there. I started actually bow hunting about 20 years ago. And for me, it was all about the adventure. I'm very competitive, so it was about the adventure and getting out there and getting close to game. I tell you, I've learned so much in my uh, experience of bow hunting. It's helped me in everything that I pursue and do. Uh, the practicing, the, the, the time, the effort, the energy, uh, it just, it's that much more difficult uh, to be successful. Not too many places left where a hunter can see two different trophies cross paths like that. But it's one of the reasons Steve has come to Montana. Though neither would come close enough for a shot, the opportunity to observe his quarry up close in their natural state was a great way to wrap up his first day of hunting. We hunted uh, field blinds for a few days, uh, which was challenging in itself. And then 
Uh, I think the highlight uh, for myself, especially with a bow, was uh, a stock and spot. Warlock Outfitters Matt Clark will take over his guide for Steve's spot and stock. That was uh, actually some adventure. I will tell you, as a producing a television show, hunting TV show, one of the worst possible things would be put in a field blind and sit there for two and a half days. And what I was thinking about during that time was the viewer is going to go to sleep watching me sitting in a in a blind. And the sad part is every time we move the blind the antelope would move to the other place that we were just at. So I told the, uh, the, the outfitter, I said, no, we're not going to do this. He goes, what do you mean we're not going to do this? I said, we've got to do a stock and spot. And he said, well, the chances of getting a, an antelope stock and spot are like 6%. And I said, it doesn't matter. We can't do this for TV. We've got to do this. If nothing else, we'll learn from this. And I can tell you it was very lucky. It was very lucky. But I also want to pass on a tip because I see this and I talk to people and, and honestly I don't hunt a lot in field blinds. I do a little bit in turkey season. But I see this all the time on shows and it drives me nuts. The number one mistake I see that people hunt out of field blinds is they actually have all the windows open. And you can't do that. They can actually see your, your outline of your body. So I'll pass that tip on. You just can't do that. So. Very fortunate on this one, but I will tell you, practice and perseveration, perseverance. Because I don't usually take a 56-yard shot, but I was ready. I was dialed in. I would started practicing nine months before. I can't emphasize those four Ps enough. Okay, so I'm going to now show you a, a different situation, um, and I'm going to talk you through that. This was an elk hunt in Montana. My passion is, is bow hunting. And I've uh, bow hunted for over 20 years. When it comes September, what I get most excited about is the here and out bugle. I had a chance to draw a tag in the Missouri Breaks area. By the way, this is the best time to actually sneak up. These are two bulls fighting. Unfortunately, the cover's not great here, but this would have been a good time to sneak up because they're fully engaged. Look at this bull. It's amazing. It's over 400. Wow, look at that bull out there. The one on the left? Yeah. Oh, how big is that? That is a dandy. He's, he's pulling in class, that bull. 400? Kid, yeah. No. Oh. Look at his spread on him. Oh. And the beams. Holy cow. No, is that, that looks like a 5x5 five five in the right hand side. There is. Yeah. That oh. sounds like we know a bull over the edge already, so. Okay, we'll side hill around the edge and try to okay. and uh, watch him come off the edge of that. Oh, I still can't believe that. Oh, that is amazing. amazing. And his, he turned his rack right at the skyline. It was yeah. unbelievable. It didn't look like it was real. No. Are you sure we're in Montana? Yeah. We yeah. are. One of the other things that, that makes elk hunting with a bow so challenging is that not only are you you're really hunting with the bull, but it's the 18 cows that are out in front or behind this bull. You look at all those eyes looking at you and all those noses trying to detect you, it just makes it that much more difficult. And I think part of the, the success is trying to figure out how to get in on tight, but knowing again that we have one chance most of the time. ridge and we viewed it twice. We snuck down and this bull was just going nuts. 
just stuck down, down the valley, down the draw. And we got quiet, he got quiet. We'll do it one more time. We went another 50 yards. And I tell you, in a matter of minutes, we looked out and we could just see he was coming. Get ready. He's coming in like that. Yeah, actually, I, see, I can see his legs. So I'm going to freeze it here. This is kind of what I call the moment of truth. So that bull is coming on me. At this point, he's five and a half yards away. And I'm going to stop here and ask you a question. In that moment of truth in your life, do you know where you're going when you leave this earth? There's really only two choices. There's heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. And I will tell you that every minute, someone has to hopefully have made that choice. So we're going to come back to this question, but I want you to think about it. I'm going to roll the tape to see what happens, to see if I have buck fever, or see what other mistake I might have made, and then we're going to talk about what happened. So this bull comes closer. <laughs> Three and a half yards. It's going to turn. You can't hear this, but the guide is actually talking to me and saying, which I didn't believe. He, he said, he's going to move his arm and this bull is going to run. He's going to cow call, listen for that, and he's going to stop at 18 yards. In my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, right. I don't think that's going to happen. But watch. I can't tell you right now uh, what happened. The arrow took off and uh, it took this 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 swirl way to the left like it hit something. Uh, but you know, it's the experience that counts, and it's just, I'll, I'll never forget that memory of having that ball over my shoulder, at, uh, probably three and a half to four yards. It was an amazing experience, and you know, that's elk hunting. Okay, so what happened? Anyone get an idea what happened? Yes, that was a clean miss, and if you want to miss, that's what you want to do. You want to have clean misses. So I'm going to tell you what happened, because I said in that, you know, I didn't, we didn't know what happened. I slowed down the tape. And this is another one of those tips I'm giving to you. I absolutely believe it translates to whitetail hunting and elk hunting. So we made several mistakes there, and I've only made them once. The first biggest mistake we made is when we heard the, there was actually two bulls, one at the bottom, one at the top. And one of the things that is so critically important, especially with a bow, is when you stop to set up for an elk or a whitetail that's actually coming at you. You still want to be covered, but you don't want to be surrounded where you can't actually have a view in the front, around the side, and the back. And so that's what happened. There was a tree. I stopped at a terrible place, and we didn't have to. That was a mistake. And what happens is when you look through a compound bow, you're looking at the sight, your arrow is down here, so you can't see this branch that came out. So what ended up happening is I hit the branch and the arrow went way to the right. What was interesting, the cameraman said, no, no, you hit it, it's good. Because when that elk turned, his antlers 
took pine needles and they fell down. And so as he's looking through the lens, he sees hair, he thought. But obviously, I didn't touch that elk. But that is one of those things that I have never, ever done again. And here's what happened a year and a half ago in New Mexico with my bow at 52 yards. This is the trip that uh, we walked 89 miles to this point. And it was the next day that that evening that we, we cow called this bull in at 52 yards. And it only went 32 yards. I think I was telling Jacob earlier, if I would have taken that shot, now I did practice for seven months, but you got to admit I was a little lucky at that one. If I'd taken that ten, shot, ten times, I don't know how many times, but this, this was a, an amazing experience. And I would also say that not only in Pennsylvania, but there's all sorts of opportunities. If you like turkey hunting, you're going to love elk hunting. And if you love elk hunting, you're going to like turkey hunting. So I want to end with the last part of this story. I mentioned earlier that I got to travel the world. This was an incredible experience. I got to travel to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, we hunted three different animals. We hunted a red stag that's actually part of the elk family. We hunted a tar that I'll show you. And we hunted a chamois that is actually part of the antelope family. But this was a really unique one. And then I told you at the very beginning, I'm an Eagles fan. Well, you might have heard this guy. His name is Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz was the second overall pick of the 2016 draft. The Eagles picked him number two, and he was the savior. Remember, the Eagles up at that point had never won a Super Bowl. So five days before the season, the Eagles traded Sam Bradford, and I'll never forget because Carson was in a duck, he was in a goose pit hunting when they told him he was going to start in five days. So Carson and the Eagles had a good season in 2016. And as part of my role at Sitka and Gore, we said, hey, Carson's a big time hunter from South Dakota. We're going to do a story. We're going to do a whole feature. What does Carson Wentz do in the off season? He hunts. And the beauty about New Zealand is the seasons are exactly opposite as ours. So it was actually April we left. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it took us two and a half days. I'd love to say go to New Zealand, and I've, I've been there a few times. It's beautiful, but my gosh, is it hard to get to. So after 27 hours in an airplane, I could not believe this is actually what happened. We landed, and they said, you're hunting today. And I said, what? We can't even, I can't even think. Uh, and this is us getting dressed in a garage. <laughs> I said, OK, I guess we're hunting today. So we did, into Carson's credit, I don't know if you could see this, but this is, uh, this is the tar. And the neat part about New Zealand is the environment and topography is very different for all three of these animals. And I'm going to show you that. So this, this happens to be my, uh, the tar that I got. The other interesting thing is that we were archery hunting, but we were also rifle hunting. And it was the first time I had to shoot my gun in at 600 yards. Anyone ever do that? It was funny. We were aiming for a square target at 600 yards. And you'd count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and you'd hear the ting. <laughs> That's how far we were shooting, especially the tar. Because wait till I show you what and where the tar live in an environment that is just unheard of. There's the red stag. It's part of the elk family. And that's Carson's brother. And this is the chamois that I mentioned to you. Do you see that back behind me? That's where the chamois are. The most difficult hunt. If there's any uh, sheep hunters or goat hunters in here, you'll know. Now, we had a little bit of an advantage because we got a ride, but I'll tell you that in a second. So I'm just showing you some of the different parts of the environment but we did get a lift up to our camp, so the helicopter took us up. I didn't know that before this trip. I didn't know we were going on a helicopter. I didn't know he was going to land. I'll show you. This is where we were hunting in this type of area, and I was like, wow, is this for real? It was for real. 
This picture might be familiar. This is actually in the movie, uh, The Lord of the Rings. Some of the environment that we were in was just breathtaking. Another shot of being, we were literally in the clouds when we dropped us off from the helicopter. And that's where we were. We were in that clouds there. Here's where we set up our camp. And the plan was that we had the chamois to take, one of the toughest animals to hunt. The helicopter would come back up and pick us up and split us up. So Carson and his brother and the guide would go to one mountain range and we would go to another. We also had a chance to hunt the fallow deer, which is what you're seeing here. There weren't many of those, but you can see how open this, this was very different, this environment. Really, I want to show you this next clip, this video, is these tar were in this thick, you can't, I don't know if you can see it, that tar is in the bottom. It was so thick, there were five and a half inch briars on both sides. It was really difficult to get in close. And then the last piece was the red stag. And I learned this later that most of the hunting in New Zealand was red stag is high fence, but we did not do any of that. It's one of my favorite pictures though. Look at this scrape that these red stag make. So Carson is 6'5". Look, look at the size of that, that scrape. Here's a trip in the helicopter that I will never forget because my heart was my throat. I kept asking the pilot, how can we land? He goes, don't worry about it. We're going to land on this cliff. Just don't look down. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not good. It's not looking good. Literally, he lands on that edge. He looks pretty calm. I was scratching the guy thinking about my wife and my son. This is unbelievable. It really was. I mean, it doesn't do it justice when you see it. Welcome to my sea view office. Oh, here we go. What do you think this Oh good? my gosh. It's top of the world. Close to heaven is where it looks like we're in the open. Close to heaven is all we got. Fantastic. What a great experience this whole trip has been. Took us what? 10 minutes to get to the top of the helicopter. Yeah. We set up camp on the other side. He dropped us off and landed right here. Watch. We're in pursuit of the elusive sham. It's uh, very excited. So again, there's where those guys are. So now I need to tell you the story. This is where the story gets real. So. Our plan was to hunt that day and hike back four and a half miles. We would hike back to that camp you saw where we set up, four and a half miles. The plan was to meet back at 8.30. It gets dark around 8.15. Everything was good. But you notice the topography here, the steepness of, of this. So 
We got back at 8.15, got dark at 8.30. We were getting ready to have dinner. And then it was 9.30, then it was 10.30, and then it was about 11.30, and I'm not making this up. I was starting to sweat, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack, for real, because they weren't back yet. And before I left for this trip, I had to clear this with our public relations group, and they asked me a question. They said, is this trip in any way dangerous? Because we as a company and you as a person are responsible for Carson Wentz, Wentz, the number one athlete, the savior for the Philadelphia Eagles, because they had never won a Super Bowl, and that's the truth. And I said, oh, no, because I didn't know about the helicopter ride on a cliff. Honest to God, truth. So I'm praying. I'm asking the the guide with me, is this usual? He goes, he stuttered, (laughs) because he didn't really want to tell me it's not usual that they're four hours late. So at 12.30 at night, I, him and I started talking about what do we need to do? There's a problem. Maybe somebody's really injured or maybe killed. Now, I said, I got to call my public relations firm, but the time zones were so off I couldn't even do that. So I'm sweating in my tent, and this is literally what I was thinking so this is my second. This is going to be a tough one. I'm going to give this prize. If anyone can tell me what is going on right here. Does anyone know? Oh, I got it back. When the Cubs fans grab the foul ball. Wonderful. We need a hand for that guy because that is it. Most people don't get this. So here it is. Can you get this mug to him? Yes. I'll pass that on. Yes. So... so you're, you're thinking, why was I thinking this? Well, I'm telling you why I was thinking this. Because I told you I'm a baseball fan. That's Steve Bartman that reaches out. 2003. The Cubs had never won a World Series, and this was their chance to go to the World Series. This was the last out. Stephen Bartman is the guy in the sweatshirt that reaches out and interferes with the play. And up until the Cubs won the World Series, his life, and I'm not making this up, was devastated. They actually bronzed his seat. They finally, when they won a World Series, but his life was destroyed, and I'm not making that up. I mean, he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't go out because everyone hated him. And you know the fans in Philadelphia are even worse than that. <laughs> so literally, and I'm not making this up, this is what I thought, and still, they're not back yet, this is what I thought was going to happen the next day the Philadelphia Inquirer got a hold of this. Schuster responsible for missing quarterback Carson Wentz. And I, we can, you know, it's kind of funny now, but man, I was dying. I'm responsible for, the, for you know, I'm still a young guy. I was like, well, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, now, it all worked out. At 1 in the morning, he came back with the guide, and what ended up happening is 15 minutes before the end of shooting time, he shoots a chamois, and it falls 450 feet straight down. And Carson was smart enough to say, I can't put my life or my career on the line. So he made the photographer and the guide rappel down, and it took him six hours to get back up. Oh. Now, Carson continues to still be a friend of mine, even though he, I wish he would have listened to me. So the Eagles end up, there's a good part of the story, and there's a bad part of the story. Good part is he's okay. And by the way, he was playing at MVP level, and then he gets hurt. But Nick Foles comes in, and they win their first Super Bowl this year. 17 and 18 was the year after this. Unfortunately, he gets injured. And uh, you could see what's happened since then when he went to Indianapolis and he went to the Redskins and he's going to get cut here in about a week, unfortunately. But he's got a great heart. He's a good guy. And he's a heck of an outdoorsman. I just wish he would have listened to me. He listened to his agent. I kept telling him, you you can't do this. Okay, we're going to shift gears here a little bit. This is actually a billboard not far from here. And it's the question that I asked you earlier to reflect on. Where are you going? Heaven or hell? I sure hope the guy in the airplane knew the answer to that. Heaven or hell? 
So here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to tell you that you heard my story. I do think this is one of the most important decisions you can make in your life. And that decision is, John 3.16 said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes will not perish and have eternal life. God did not come to this world to condemn it. He came to save it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes. Close your eyes. And if you're ready tonight, not tomorrow, because I, I learned that we're not guaranteed that we'll be here tomorrow. And I care about you and I care about that decision. What I'd like you to do, still have your eyes closed, is if you want to make this decision, it's a personal decision, if you want to make this decision right now tonight to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the pastor, myself, and others will be up here after the service because this is just the beginning. What, keep your eyes closed because this is not to call attention. I just want you to raise your hand if you're willing to make this decision tonight. And I can guarantee it will change your life. Just put your hand up. Just raise your hand if you're willing to make this decision tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My prayer is that you'll be with, with everyone that's here, and especially those that made this decision tonight. I can't thank you enough, Lord, for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. That is it for me tonight, but I will tell you there's a few things. I'm serious about what I just said. I'll pray for those who put their hand up. It is just the beginning. It changes everything. The other thing that I will tell you I'd be happy to talk to you. One thing I forgot to mention on the elk drawing is right now you can apply for zones. I'd be happy to talk to you about what zones I would recommend. I was sincere when I said, you need to do this. It's a great experience. As of February 5th, you could put in your zone. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone that's interested. Everyone should be, but that's your choice to make. And again, remember what I said at the beginning, at least, if nothing else, I've touched your heart and i lifted your spirits. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for your time tonight. It's pretty neat to hear from somebody that has traveled so much and done a lot of hunting that probably no one else here has done or will have the opportunity to do. So that's really neat. And we thank you again uh, for coming and speaking for us uh, tonight. And again, if anybody, um, <clears throat> if you don't have a church, we want to welcome you to join us tomorrow. Or if you make a commitment or anything like this, we would love to talk to you, pray with you after the service, whatever that might look like. Uh, but we want to transition at this time to the, the raffle. Uh, we're going to do the giveaways here and Again, we thank you all for coming, and thank you to everybody again from Grace Chapel that donated items. Uh, we have quite a bit here. We have nearly 50 different raffle items that came in this year, so we're really, really excited about that. <clears throat> and we have a no number of people ready. Yes. Wonderful.